And now we're going to get into the reason why all of us are here. First, we, I'd like to introduce Beji Yang. She's going to be the, the, po the person hosting the Fireside Chat. She is a managing partner here at 500 Startups. And she and all of us have the luxury of interacting with Martin Liao. And he is a partner at 500 Startups. He's running the SF-based seed program, as well as investing in startups. He is a former Yahoo executive, and he invests in digital media, enterprise SaaS, marketplace, mobile, ad tech, and marketing tech, digital health, and the internet of things, and fintech startups. And he definitely is our resident expert in all things Accelerator. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Beji, and we'll get started with the webinar. Take it away, Beji. Hello, everyone. Uh, excited to be here today with Marvin. Uh, Marvin, I run our, he runs our accelerator program now for 10 batches. Mm -hmm. It's been four and a half years that Marvin has been with us. So today, the structure that we're going to go through is we're going to start all the way very high level from trends to very specific sort of tricks and lessons learned from your journey here with 500 startups. Mm -hmm. So before we start diving deeper on the trends and tricks, I'd love to have you tell us your experience and your journey on how did you end up here with us? Sure. Um, so I've actually been here in Silicon Valley. It's great to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I've actually been here in Silicon Valley now for almost 20 years. So when I first moved here, I actually worked in the startup world for a couple of years. Worked at an e-commerce startup that raised about $30 million. I wasn't successful, but learned a lot. And I ended up joining Yahoo as an exec in the early days. And so I was at Yahoo for about 10 and a half years. And I was very, very fortunate to have done, you know, all right over there. So I was just decided to take some time off. And uh, during the time off, I was had the fortune of meeting the 500 team and got to know the team very well and became a mentor. Did Geeks on the Plane, became a mentor. Did, did that for almost like a year and a half and doing the commute down to Mountain View. And it was super fun. And I think um, you all felt pretty guilty for all the time I was putting in. So when the San Francisco office opened, um, you asked me to join. And so I've been with you guys since, uh, since uh, January of 2014. Um, so I've been, I think, part of the 500 family now for... Yeah, since 2012. That was crazy. Yeah. 2012. So we decided to first uh, keep you unpaid for yeah. one and a half years, and yeah. now we're like, longer. all right. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and I will dive a little bit deeper about the uh, 500 mentorship uh, because I think that's how you ended up joining sure. us. But maybe we'll start on a higher level from a VC sort of perspective, right? Yeah. So I'd love to hear more of like, what's the role of an accelerator within the broader VC component? And tell us, where did you see the VC sort of trends that are going? Yeah. So I, I actually think the role of accelerator is actually super, super important in the ecosystem um, because it usually is like the first place that a startup founder can basically enter the community. It's the first place where they learn a lot of the basics of running a startup. Um, and if it's done, you know, if the program's done well, and, and I see this university, if you look at the growth of most ecosystems, whether it's here in Silicon Valley, you know, with y, you know, y Combinator, or like Techstars across the rest of the US, and other sort of like excellent sort of accelerator programs across the globe, this is really the start of, uh, in my opinion, sort of a great way to congeal the, the community, great way to spread a lot of best practices and learnings. And it's almost like a new MBA. And I think it's way better than new MBA. You know, so it is the new MBA, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so my take is I think it's a critical role. And I spe spe specifically now uh, where you're starting to see a lot more sort of like concentration of accelerator programs where there's a bunch of generalist programs like YC and us, um, you know, Angel Pad, which is also an excellent program. But then there's tons of really interesting sort of programs, very, very specific in like, for example, there's indie bio, right? Um, there's um, even very, very specific things like IoT. You're starting to see a lot more specialization. Or um, my friends at Upwest Labs, where they focus on Israeli founders, bring Israeli founders to Silicon Valley, and they run a great program, but they're focusing just on, on sort of Israeli founders, for example, right? And so you're starting to see a lot more specialization, at least in the accelerator world. And I actually think that's the only way a new accelerator can compete right now, because the reality is that you know, otherwise, if you're a journalist program, you're competing against us and Y Combinator, um, and we'll crush you, 
Mm -hmm. um, just realistically, right? We built a brand over the last seven years as a program. We've run a lot of programs. So it just takes time to sort of like learn this stuff. And as a new program, it's just you're starting to build from scratch. You're just not going to be able to get the best deal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, from a broader perspective from the venture, uh, because Accelerator probably sits at that super early stage sure. of the founder uh, life cycle. And even from the VC component, sure. and how do you see that sort of the VC world and trends? And well, what, what, has hap what has happened, particularly in the last like three or four years, is that uh, you know with the rise of the seed stations, you know there were something like six hundred seed funds that were raised in the last I say you know five to six years. Mm -hmm. I think what's happened, you've seen the wheat sort of you know sort of like separate from the chaff a lot. And so what you've seen is a lot of these funds that were raised in the last four or five years, unfortunately, they were raised during sort of the peak period of seed, and so a lot of them just are not around anymore. And then what's happening is that a lot of the seed funds that have done very, very well, like Uncorked, Floodgate, you know, Initialize, you go down the list of just an excellent, excellent cowboy, these really, really top tier affiliates, like top tier VC funds in seed stage, they've done really, really well. So now they're able to raise just much larger funds. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they've moved upstream. So where before they used to write like several hundred thousand dollar checks, now they're writing like 750, one million dollar checks. So they just moved upstream. So there's actually quite a huge gap right now from an institutionalized, you know, institutionalized capital perspective, sort of after us. Mm -hmm. And so, but having said that, we are seeing a lot more angels try to pick up the pace, as well as some new emerging sort of like VC funds in general. But there is a huge gap and opportunity right now in seed. And I think a lot of accelerated programs are also slowly kind of waking up to this, or have woken up to this in the last couple of years. Um, and been able to move upstream too. So when, when I first was mentoring here at 500, like we took a lot of like pre-launch, super, super early stage companies. And I think partly due to sort of like the change in the ecosystem, partly due to sort of our growing, I, I guess, brand and sort of established sort of reputation, we've also been able to move upstream. So most of the companies right now that we're taking in already have a working product, probably have some revenue already. So we've also kind of moved upstream as well too. And that's what I'm seeing in general with a lot of the more established programs that they've been able to move more upstream, partly because ecosystems has changed so much. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned uh, when you were describing the landscape, you did mention uh, if the program is done well. Yeah. And I, I want to, and then very quickly you mentioned very important to have like the specialization. I want to sort of unwrap that component of what does that mean when you, because you are very candid and critical, uh, what, when do you feel like a program is done well and how do you qualify that? Um, well, well, number one is just, I think the, the business model of the Accelerate is a very challenging one from an economics perspective. Having said that, I think it takes at least three or four rounds before you actually really know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was very, very fortunate when I came, you know, when I joined 500, that there was already some infrastructure in place. And there's also some knowledge, right? Like I, I was very fortunate to work very closely with Parker Thompson and he had already run like two batches prior. And so I was able to leverage a lot of that knowledge, right? To sort of like, to, to sort of kickstart. And even then I still was like in the learning, I'm still learning, right? Um, the reality is that it takes at least like three batches before you know what you're doing. And that means to every single area of running a program, right? It's the recruitment process. Like how do you get the best companies and get enough, you know, sort of like deal flow. Second part is the selection process, which I think is also really, really critical. And that's something I've been spending a lot of time fine tuning here at 500. Um, then the actual program itself, like are you running a good useful program that legitimately helps the companies that come in? And then it's the post batch and fundraising support afterwards. Like, can you help in all these components? And these are all very different components and it takes a while to sort of get them right. And so the reality is that any new accelerator program, it just takes a while to figure this stuff out. And, and depending on the ecosystem that you're in, it could even be harder, right? Considering that we're based here in Silicon Valley. And so even understanding these components, it just, it takes a while to figure this out. I think that's a, that's a main point. And so how I look at success is besides figuring out all these components, you know, there's, there's a one part, which is most accelerated programs talk about. It's like, how many of your companies actually raise money and how much money they raise? That's one angle. I don't think it's the only angle. And I think it's, it's an easy metric to look at. Um, and I think we do pretty well over there, but I also think the biggest part is like, you know, do you help the company grow from a sales and marketing perspective? 
right? And so for us, we look at really hard numbers of, you know, from a user base, like, were we able to help you grow your user base? Were we able to help you grow your, your you know, your customer base, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other part is NPS, like, do you get referrals, mm -hmm. right? Like, do people, you know, do, do people, do your startup founders recommend you to other startup founders? So what would you say then in that case, because very often the differentiation, it's very important, right? Whether your differentiation today, it's going more into specialization. What would you say would be sort of 500 differentiation and superpower? I think, I, I think if you ask any founder who's come to a program or you ask anybody, our reputation is growth. Mm -hmm. And so we help companies with sales and marketing and figuring out customer acquisition. And, and I think philosophically, we're very different than a lot of other, you know, sort of VC funds are very, very philosophically, very, very different than a lot of accelerated programs in Silicon Valley in general, or just in general, mm -hmm. because we think that yes, product is important. We think clearly very, very important. But we also think that if you think about the main reason that most startups actually fail is, is because they can't get customers in a cost effective way. And so we have specifically invested in resources and expertise in this area to help our companies. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's kind of our superpower in general. Um, and the other thing that we're doing is we're, we're starting to build out tracks, right? So we built out, we, we are a journalist program. So we focus a lot on the customer acquisition, sales marketing. We focus a lot on storytelling, positioning and pitching. But we also focus a lot on like fundraising. Like these are all critical things that everyone needs to know. The other thing we've kind of done too is we've built out these specific verticals. So we have run verticals in FinTech and that has been very, very successful for us. We've run verticals of, of specific companies that, you know, that, you know, three to five companies in digital health. Uh, blockchain is another one that we're, we're spending a lot of time in. Um, and just building on expertise, of so deep expertise, you know, EIR is what we call entrepreneurs and residents, people who are deep experts in this area that can help our companies and to build out sort of very, very deep vertical expertise to bring in specialized companies too and bring in partnerships, bring in mentors, mm -hmm. investors to help these companies. Um, and that's sort of, I, I feel like, areas that we tend to be thriving. That makes sense. And then uh, you mentioned sometimes it takes like three, four batches until like you feel that you have a good grasp on that. Uh, anything you think you can help people starting today, maybe fast forward, like what would be like maybe one or two biggest sort of lessons learned? Um, that's a great, it's a great question. I mean, unfortunately there's like no books on this stuff, right? Like <laughs> manual, send us the manual. Be great if there's a manual. Uh, and, and, and I think like, you know, you know, without selling sort of like BAM, like having, you know, being able to talk to people who've actually run accelerated programs and having some framework and structure to think about this is, is very, very helpful in, in general. Um, but, you know, my take is that the biggest thing is just like trying to figure out like what, you know, from the beginning of being thoughtful about what you think your differentiation is as mm. a program and in, in the type of companies, like have a very clear thesis, no different than sort of as a VC fund of like, what's the thesis of, of the, of the type of companies that you should be you know, looking at. Is it super, super early? Is there some specific vertical industry that you want to focus on? And then the biggest part is also trying to understand like, what's the biggest problem you think these, based on that criteria, what's the biggest problem that these companies are facing? And what's the one or two things that you as a program are going to help these companies in, right? You know, maybe is it on the fundraising side? Is it on the product development side? So for example, Hacks has done a great job in helping companies you know, figure out, you know, figure out like um, Kickstarter, right? Like mm -hmm. they've been fantastic at that. I think like you know, Accelerator, they're great at this stuff, um, particularly with hardware companies. Like they are, they have the manual basically for how you do like a Kickstarter campaign to get the initial sort of like money to basically build a product um, as well as plugging you into a lot of like the hardware sort of manufacturing. Like nobody does it better. Mm -hmm. Right. So for example, and so trying to figure out sort of the niche that you're in and how you differentiate yourself just based on niche, but also where are you specifically help the companies and what type of, you know, how hands-on are you going to be? What type of mentor network you're going to build out to support these companies, partnerships you need. And so just being thoughtful about that from the beginning, I think will help you. Um, and then on top of that, I think also what is important is that I think we are starting a program, like starting with a small group of companies and almost over-servicing them. Mm -hmm. So you get the good NPS and good word of mouth. Um, mm -hmm. Like, cause I was very fortunate cause I inherited a good brand name already inherited. Like I joined, I think I started running batch eight. 
So there are already like seven programs that are already run. There was a, there's already starting to be some good word of mouth for 500 in general. And so there's a foundation I built on. I think starting from scratch, like you have to be very thoughtful about how you actually really, really over service the companies, how you think about the content and the things that you want to focus and help. Uh, so we'll dive a little bit deeper. I think you mentioned, you came in as a mentor and you yeah. mentioned the sort of mentors uh, network yeah. and also it would be interesting to see like how you structure your team today, sure. right? So that give us a little bit of also overview of how hands-on and how you think about the overall resources yeah. of people. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that we are very people, this is a very people, um, you know, sort of intensive business is that we have about 15 full-time, part-time people on my, like I have 15 full-time, part-time people on my staff. And if you think about sort of how they're divided, they're divided between, EIRs, which are entrepreneurs and residents, some are full-time, some are part-time. And we also have a lot of um, in-house distribution, what we call it online marketing, B2B sales, sales experts on staff too. And the way that we think about this is, you know, we typically, from a content perspective, we have three to five workshops a week. Um, so, cause, cause we're trying to figure out the balance, right? For us, where, you know, the way we think about this is you can be highly programmed like a tech stars and that works really, really well for them. Or you could have basically very minimal program like a Y Combinator, but not very, very large scale. We've decided to sort of take a little bit more of a middle ground where there's some programming. So like I said, three to five sort of like workshops, content talk things. Um, and the other thing that we do where, the, where there's a lot more of the hands-on work is that every company um, that, that comes into our program, we pair them off with an EIR that's specific that either knows your industry or is just better suited for that company. And as well as paired off with a distribution expert, so an online marketing or B2B sales expert, depending on your industry and product and, and such. And so the idea is that they're required to meet at least once a week. So we keep on top of them and we're very metrics driven. So a big part of it is trying to help them think through what is the one metric that matters, depending what it is. Maybe it's user growth, maybe it's a retention number, who knows, whatever it is. And we spend time with them every week to help them drive that number higher during the program. And so that's part of the reason we, we care a lot and why we're so staff intensive is we're here to help companies build big, interesting businesses. And the way you do that is by sharing with them the best practices and driving this discipline into them and their team. So when they leave here, they can be self-sufficient. So from the structure of the accelerator, uh, can you tell us today how much uh, you invest in the companies, sure. how much equity, uh, and then also diving deeper is how do you run the selection process sure. and the criteria sure. for that? So, so for us, um, so the, pro the, the program itself is, is that we invest 150,000 for 6%. Uh, we withhold 37 and a half K for program fees because like all this content costs money, you know, or people cost money. So, you know, this basically goes back to sort of, you know, that we invested into our staffing to support the companies. Um, and so in regards to the selection process, like we are no different than any other VC fund out there, right? Like we're looking at all the same things, like all these really, really great teams, like interesting teams that have a good understanding of their, of their customer base and a good understanding of the market. Um, does the market actually make sense? So it has to be clearly a big market, you know, the total addressable market, or at least, a perceived total addressable mm -hmm. market. Um, are they differentiated? Because in, you know, there's no market right now that is not saturated with competition. Um, traction, you know, have they been accomplished a lot with what they've done? Um, and also is there downstream capital for what they're doing? And that doesn't, that doesn't drive the decision, but just understanding that, hey, if we invest, even though we like the team and the market, but there's no downstream capital where investors hate the space, I still, I'll still probably do the deal, but it's just good to understand. Right. Mm -hmm. Because then a part of it's also managing expectations like, hey, by the way, you know, you're in a space that everyone hates, at least in the short run. Understand that fundraising may be challenging and that's OK. Then the focus should really be just on building the business and getting customers because investors, frankly, are sheep. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they come in and out. What's sexy now is not going to be sexy like two years from now. And who cares? Because we're early stage. And as long as the business is around, the markets turn very quickly. And so that's the way I think about it at least from a, from a selection process. And we put a lot of time into why we care a lot about diversity is I have a lot of people on my team, you know, younger, older, different industry, male, female, international, US, because all these diverse views help inform and, and help us sort of look at, at companies from very different angles and help us select, hopefully, what is the best company. 
um, how often do you feel like between when you're doing interview and you have all the framework for deciding whether to invest or not, and after they have come through the program, how often do you feel you change your opinion? About yeah, all the time. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the reality is this is just really, really hard. Like I know week four or five where I screwed up, right? Yeah. Because the, the thing is you're dealing with people. And so people are just unpredictable, right? Like some people interview well, Americans interview super, super well, right? Versus almost everywhere else in the world, they don't interview as well. So the way that you ask questions and think about stuff, and I've, I feel like I've gotten better at this, but you still get it wrong. I mean, the reality is that for every 30 companies I bring into a batch, you know, and, and, and in this case, it's probably 25 to 35 companies we bring in every single program. Um, the reality is that probably five or six of them are like, just really like, I'm just off on the, like in the sense of just like, I was really wrong mm -hmm. about them. Just there are certain things we just weren't able to capture. And so this is what makes it tough. But in general, I feel like we have a good handle on this. And But we're always fine tuning the selection process. But it's the same thing we look at. This is just, it's hard. It's a people business at a super early yeah, stage. Yeah, at a super, super early stage. So like a lot of times you're not looking at a lot of, like even from a traction perspective, it's like, it's hard. And, and truth of the matter, the best investors aren't looking at traction. Mm -hmm. Attractions one data point. Yep. Uh, I want to then dive uh, look back to a broader sense uh, because I know you're always you, you're building sort of this uh, launch pad for founders here in Silicon Valley, and of course we're within the Silicon Valley context. But you're always like on the road. I think you were just in Eastern Europe. Yeah. You came back from uh, Budapest. From Budapest. Dubai and Budapest. So. Uh, that means that you have a lot of views of like the global ecosystem, sure. right? So what would you say that you like to see more, for instance, maybe it's hard to generalize, but like in markets that are not Silicon Valley, a lot of people try to be Silicon Valley. What's your view on that? Yeah, I, I think it's this idea just that there's one Silicon Valley, right? And I think the only closest competitor in just Silicon Valley is like China, right? Yeah. Like you know, Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai, yeah. Hangzhou, like that's the only closest sort of like ecosystem. I think the reality is that, that I remember Mark Such just this thing called like term called Silicon Stupid, right? So it's like, oh, Silicon Prairie, Silicon this, it's so dumb. Um, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But having said that, like I'm very, very bullish and that's been a big part of 500, why I joined 500 is really the international sort of focus in general. Like the, the biggest opportunities are actually from outside, right? And I'm starting to see a lot of interconnections in general between a lot of the outside ecosystems in here. You know, so for example, like I'm super bullish on Canada, not just as a Canadian, but like Canada's really interesting ecosystem. Um, I think Australia, New Zealand, I think Central Eastern Europe, Portugal, Baltic region, like these are all really interesting ecosystems. Um, and I, especially as they start being better in, interconnected with like Silicon Valley, you're going to see some really interesting companies because like I see really, really good, interesting companies coming out like with strong technical founders. I think the biggest gap in general, I think sales and marketing is a weakness. Mm -hmm. I think presentation skills are a major weakness in a lot of these countries, even in Canada. And I also think this, what I think is very, very unique about Silicon Valley is just in general, and you can decide whether this is a good or bad thing, but I think founders, at least in Silicon Valley, like think big, mm -hmm. like from the beginning. And I think that's a huge issue in general with a lot of founders who are, who are just as smart, just as capable, a lot of the, the, the founders I meet here, mm -hmm. but they just don't think big. And I think it's, a, it's, for me, it's an environmental issue. It's not, it's like, if I think about nature versus nurture, it's not a nature issue. I think it's a nurture issue of just being in that environment. And that's why I'm super bullish on the accelerator in general, that we can pull these founders from all across the globe and plug them into this ecosystem and really open their eyes mm -hmm. to sort of like what the opportunities are and how big the opportunity is. And I've, like I said, some of my best companies have been immigrant founders or like founders from like outside of the US. And I think by injecting a lot of the best practices and injecting them into this community, they just allow, it forces them to, it by nature, just forces them to think bigger mm -hmm. and they start to thrive, I think, at, at just at a higher level. And so that's why, you know, this is, I've been doing this for so long because to just be able to see that and to be able to help folks find their, their sort of potential. I think it's like, this is like the best gig on the planet, right? And that's, I think that's the best <laughs> part about Accelerator is that you help people figure out their potential. Not everybody, right? Then some people decide like, this isn't for me and that's okay. Yeah. But like, this is the opportunity and, of, of, and why I spend so much time overseas because a lot of times it's just that they don't know what is possible. Um, but it is like they are totally capable of actually doing just as well as all the, the, the sort of Valley founders that you hear about. So you're setting the context for them to be successful. Correct. Yeah. And at least opening their eyes, hopefully. 
Uh, we're gonna open uh, soon for Q and A. My last question is, what keeps you up at night? Um, I mean, it's super competitive, right? This is a yeah. super competitive space, and and the reality is, you know, the competition I have in the Excel space is heating up in general, right? Like, there's a lot of new entrants who are really thinking about thinking about accelerator model and business in a different way. And that's great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, you know, we have like Y Comrade, which is just, they've been around for 13 years. They've been doing this way longer than we have and have a great brand. And so the, the reality is that, you know, the competition keeps me up, right? And, and making sure that at least from a team perspective that I'm building the capabilities in this team and that my companies are happy that we continue, we are continually able to support the companies afterwards. You know, I give my, you know, I, I think we do a great job at the program. Mm -hmm. At least post program, I feel like we still have a lot of work to do there. So maybe it's a B or B minus, and sort of how we support the companies post. So there's every aspect of the program. I want us to be at an A plus, right? And I, I don't think we're there yet. And so that's what keeps me up at night. And, and also just a changing landscape of of making sure my companies are able to raise money, especially in light of all the things that are happening at the seed stage. Yeah. Um, it is tougher. And so one of the things I'm spending a lot more time thinking about is how do we build more capabilities into the program to arm these companies and actually even manage expectations that fundraising isn't everything. Um, and sometimes we get so caught up into, into, oh, you know, fundraising, 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 when the reality is just about building great sales okay. and marketing and just building great companies and, and good business capabilities into a company so they can raise down the road. Not because like, I just think like fundraising as a metric success, I think is really dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the many metrics, not the metric of success. And I think we get caught up in that. And so that's something I, I, I think a lot about. Great. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, I'm going to send back to Patrick uh, so that we can hear other questions. Patrick, back to you. Great, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And we have received some questions. Just a reminder, if you do have questions, please post them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So the first one is uh, that I'll read is from Marsha Wolf, and she's actually a VCU alum. Uh, another plug for our VCU education programs. And uh, so how is the best way for local accelerators, specifically in emerging economies, what is the best way for them to link to capital and uh, in order to create a robust deal flow? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a great question. And I, I think it's tough, right? The reality is that, that if you, whether you're a VC, whether you're a startup founder, whether you're an accelerator manager, like you just got to hustle. You just got to be talking to a lot of like investors. Maybe it's like, you know, doing a lot of like education of sort of even the local ecosystem, you know, and typically it'd be like angels of, you know, my view is like, it's probably angels, like local angels and educating them in regards to sort of sharing with them the opportunities that you have. But that's a tough one. Like you just gotta be hustling and talking to everybody, right? And building those relationships, you know, not just in your ecosystem, but even outside your ecosystem. Um, that's probably would be, you know, that's a, it's a, it's a simple answer, but the reality is that there's no way around. It's just a lot of hard work of talking to a lot of people and trying to get people interested in what you're doing and building out sort of like ties to even programs like ours. I, you know, we are very interested in talking to a lot of other accelerated programs overseas because they, some of them act as great feeders for us. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> Uh, so here's one from your experience, Marvin. What is the distribution of single founders and founding teams in each cohort of, you know, 25 to 35? Has that changed? Not really. I mean, the, the reality is that it varies. And so for us, like, we think, we think it's probably better to have sort of like, you know, two founders or three founders. But in, in reality, probably about like, one fifth of my you know, one fifth of my companies in general are probably single single founders, and that's okay. The, the reality is that, and we're very open about the fact that we prefer teams, but don't build out a team, you know, and make it unnatural, right? Like it has to be very organic. And so our view is just that I've seen great sort of like multi-founder you know, sort of like businesses do well. I've also seen great like single founder sort of like businesses do well. And so I'm actually not biased against either one. It, it just has to make sense in general. Creating kind of a, in the same vein, what's more important for a VC, uh, an alumni team from HBS, Stanford, and MIT with an amazing product with no revenue yet, or product market fit with minimum, rev with minimum revenue? 
Yeah, I, you know, he, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. And, and truth of the matter is I'm a little bit biased against sort of like the HBS and sort of like Stanford teams. Um, just been my experience. Like I, I actually am a very, very big fan in general of immigrant founders and like international founders. I just think they work harder. They're hungrier in general, in general. Right. Um, but I, I don't think there's one, one or the other, like my take is great. You got into HBS, like it just means you know how to take tests well, right? Doesn't mean you know how to execute. And so like, there's a lot of things that go into it. I, I think these, these badges are not always helpful and they hide a lot of things and you have to dig in a lot more. Great. And this is from Victor Cruz. How can accelerators stay involved with startups after they complete the program? Yeah. And, and that's something we struggle with considering we have, I think over 600 companies that have gone through our program in the last seven years. Um, it is, it is a struggle. Um, and so for example, that's one of the reasons I've, I've been building out like a portfolio management team. Um, what we're trying to do a lot more sort of community events and things just to get them engaged. We invite all the alumni to our events, even during sort of like our accelerator talks and things, all 500 alumni are actually invited to our events. So we try to keep engaged from that perspective, but boy, that's also just really hard, right? And especially as you do more and more programs. Um, but having said that, we try to involve a lot of our alumni into sort of like coming and speaking, joining panels, sharing their knowledge with sort of like the previous batches because they're kind of like the elder siblings. And I'll say majority of our, of our batch companies Founders usually do come back and do talks and try to get engaged with with the community and, and majority have been very good about that or a good portion have been very good about that. <clears throat> All right. And so how can accelerators make a good balance between mentoring entrepreneurs for just the right amount versus getting in their way of doing business? This is from yeah. Jesse. I mean, awesome, awesome question and something we struggled with as, as well too, right? Where, you know, do you want to be like super, super hands-on where you're almost like running their business? That's usually not a great thing. And, and that's a criticism in general with VC platforms overall, right? Like doing it for them is never a good thing, but being super hands-off and just like myself, just not join your program, right? And not do anything. And so it is, it is a, it is it is a challenge that we wrestle with and we fine tune with every single program overall. And so the way that we think about it, and I'm very, very clear about this, at least from the beginning is that we're here as your advisors. Like we're not here to do stuff for you. Like, you know, we might make some introductions and we're going to give you advice and you're actually going to get a ton of advice. You know, you're going to get a ton of mentoring, ton of advice. And a lot of it, actually will probably be like counter, you know, sort of like, you know, counter to sort of the advice that you get, you get this like thing called mental whiplash, right? But I think also our job is to, to provide the framework to help them think through a lot of the feedback and advice that they're actually getting. And also making sure that, that at least in the beginning, you're very, very clear is that we're here to help you and to advise you, but not to actually do stuff for you. Um, and generally speaking, those founders tend not to be good ones anyways. I want you to do everything for them. And so it's a balance of, of trying to, you know, it's, it is a balance. And also, of course, a big part is actually making sure that people on your team actually do understand startups, have worked at startups. You know, almost everyone on my team have been involved in startups in some form or other. So hopefully provide sort of very relevant sort of experience versus say as a corporate person, like your advice that you're going to give a startup is pretty much useless. Um, and so it's, it's, you want to make sure you have the right mentors and the right staffing as well too, that, that are giving the companies great advice that are actionable and useful and relevant. It's going to follow on to what you just mentioned. If someone is coming from a corporate finance background, but wants to make the switch to VC, what would your recommendations be for them? I just think for them, like understand that you probably don't know anything. Um, so ignorance is just understand your own ignorance, um, provide advice, but like you want to caveat a lot of the advice. And, and the other thing too, it just like really just mentor a lot. Like that's how I made the transition. I mentored and I don't know if I gave great advice, if I'm honest <laughs> in the first sort of year or so, but you learn along the way. And, but you also want to be very clear about sort of actually understand sort of what is relevant to startups and what isn't relevant and make sure that you caveat it very clearly. Um, because like I, I have, I just, I know a lot of, maybe myself included, I know a lot of corporate people who've made that transition and it just, it's, it's a rough transition because the, the, the advice that you give and based on your own experience as a corporate person, corporates are not startups and startups are not corporates and you just have to understand that. 
but Great. do a lot of injury. <laughs> Now transitioning to post program again, uh, does 500 incorporate some sort of mechanisms to help companies raise later funds and then do 500 itself actually uh, follow on with some funding rounds as well? Yeah, so I, I would say in the last couple of years, so okay, so um, you know, do we help our company with fundraising? Yes, but a lot of it, frankly, is driven by the founders. So I would say probably a third of my founders, you know, we talk on a regular basis. Another third of my founders, I find like just ping me when they need stuff, and that's okay, right? When there's some specific sales issue, team issue, fundraising issue, and probably a third I just never hear from, um, either because I don't know, you know, they're just they're dead or they're, they're, they're running things fine. Right. And so a lot of our engagement is really relying on the founders. And so some founders are very, you know, we talk with on a regular basis and some, we just never hear from, um, you know, in regards to follow on investment in the last couple of years, we have actually not done a lot of follow on in general um, because of just a weird signaling. And I think this is something that I think every program needs to be thoughtful about too, where what, you know, and the, the reason I did this, at least why we stopped doing some follow on was because what would end up happening is just you end up wrecking it for a lot of the rest of the batch. So what happens if you do follow one or two companies and you don't do follow on the rest of them, VCs know this and they ask around like, well, which ones, you know, which ones did 500 follow on these, you must know something that we don't know. And so that's part of the reason I, I have been not as aggressive about doing follow on for a lot of the batch companies, at least until the series A, because we're just very, very careful about just not signaling to the, the, the sort of like the down, the upstream market. Um, and so that's us. And that's something I think that every seller also needs to be thoughtful about too, because you don't necessarily want to provide the wrong signal and kind of wreck it for the majority of your batch companies. And so that's part of the reason we've done what we've done. Interesting. And this is from Long Fam. And what is the role of accelerators in ecosystem building, especially in countries slash cities where the community isn't very robust? I think I think the role of an accelerator, I'm I think is absolutely, absolutely critical. The role of a good accelerator program helps to crystallize and catalyze the local ecosystem, you know, provide a lot of the education and best practice for startup founders. Um, like if it's well run, right? Unfortunately, most are not very well run, but I think that, that they're really, really important. And if you look at, for example, the growth of the Boulder ecosystem, I mean, that's due to Techstars, right? That's, that's the only reason Techstars is, is such a, a, an interesting, interesting place or Capital Factory in Austin, Texas is also a big sort of like driver of a local community. So I, I think they're really critical. Excellent answer. And now this is kind of an experiential question. What is the most interesting go-to market strategy you have seen for a multi-sided platform? <laughs> okay, uh, that's, uh, that's a good, good question. So um, we have we had this one company in batch a called GoSmith. And so if you look at most marketplace businesses, they're usually supply driven, right? So what you do is you aggregate all the supply. And then what you do is you once you aggregate supply, you basically go and find the demand, right? And what they did, which is really, really different is that, um, so just to explain what these guys did, um, they basically were a marketplace, like it's kind of like a handy, right? Like their marketplace for um, like home repair and marketplace for, um, you know, like home renovations. And so what they did was that they, they went to, they basically got projects. So they, they drove it more from a demand perspective. They got projects, they found projects. And then what they did is they went to like Angie's list and a bunch of other sort of like suppliers and went to them and said, Hey, you know, are you interested in, in like, taking on this $50,000 sort of project. And of course, who's gonna say no when you bring in business? And they said, oh, by the way, we're having, we have this platform called Smith, you should come join our platform. And so the way they were able to shortcut is by finding sort of like projects and then using that to go in, like, you know, when you bring in money to sort of suppliers, they're, they're obviously gonna join you very, very quickly. And so that's what they did to shortcut um, that marketplace. That one stuck in my head because it, they took such a different dynamic to sort of growing their marketplace. Great, now kind of a, we have a few more questions, so hopefully we'll get to all of them before we close up in a few minutes. Um, I guess in terms of 500's international reach, can you speak a little bit about how it's involved in Europe? And uh, yeah, well, let's focus on Europe for now. 
Yeah, so we, we do have an office out in London and we have and, and we have actually made quite a lot of investments out in Europe in general. And so between the investments that we made as well as me just spending a lot of time, I'm, I'm out in Europe probably every five or six weeks. Um, or, or if I'm not out there, a lot of colleagues, a lot of my team is out there. Um, you know, we're very bullish on Europe in general. We think it's one of the most interesting um, markets, both from a deal flow perspective, but also the deal flow versus the money supply, you know, and I say, I'm talking about like VC angel investment where there is a massive, you know, sort of imbalance where high quality startups, as well as um, sort of just a low level of, and low quality of investors in general. And so that's an interesting and unique opportunity where there's also a lot of founders want to go global as well too. Um, and so Europe is very interesting between the founders that we have, us being on the ground and spending a lot of time out there. Um, I would say probably about, I'm going to say probably one fifth of my batches turn out to be European companies. And so super, super bullish on the region. Great. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. This next one is, is a specific geography question as well. Your take on the Indian startup ecosystem and what yeah. has 500 done in India. Yeah, so, so Indian startup ecosystem is, is awesome, right? It's a huge, huge local market. Plus you have a lot of, you know, Besides having a huge local market, you have a lot of great technical talent, very entrepreneurial people in general. And also there's a lot of very interesting sort of global focused companies because of the English language. And so as a market, we have invested quite a lot over there. I think the challenge with India in general is just a legal entity. Investing in an Indian legal, legal entity as a U.S. fund is just really, really hard just from a cost of like legal and timing and whatnot, but like the deal flow and, and you know, the entrepreneurs coming out of the region are amazing. And so like super, super bullish on, on the region. Great. And then I think this is going to be the final question in terms of the history of 500's own kind of startup phase. How long did it take until it kind of reached the point of being a successful accelerator? Um, I mean, the, the reality is that probably by like batch six or seven, we were starting to see some really, really interesting things coming. Um, if I'm very, very honest, I, I think even as a mentor, I was a mentor for batch tail end of batch four, beginning of, tail, you know, beginning of batch five in general. I think that we were still learning the ropes during that time. But I would say from like, you know, batch six, batch seven, batch eight um, onwards, like we, I think we sort of hit our stride, right? And that was what, three years in? probably two or three years in. So it takes a while, right? Like this is, it's just, it's a, it's something that you just have to work at for like a long time. Like anything, anything that you want to get good at, you just got to do this for a while, right? Like I've, I've been doing this now, like I said, almost five years. It actually is almost five years now. And I'm not sure I've hit my stride yet. Like I just still think there's a lot that you have to learn and, and it's about mastery, right? So like it just takes a while and you got to be prepared to be doing this for a while if you want to get good at this, like anything. Great. And I think that is about all the time we have. Unfortunately, we can't get to all of the questions. Uh, but I will do one more final plug for our boot camp for accelerator managers before I pass it off back off to Marvin and Beji to say their goodbyes. And again, this is our program that focuses on accelerator managers in order to improve their current operations, to figure out kind of what their superpower is, how to recruit the best startups, how to make money. And it's a five day long program, a pretty intensive program located in San Francisco. Uh, this will be, I think, our third or fourth cohort. And we've had some great graduates from the program in the past. You can find the application and more information about BAM at education.500.co backslash accelerator. Again, it's from October 22nd to 26th. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to bcunlocked at 500startups.com. And just as kind of a final logistics point before I pass it back off, this will be sent out a recording of this kind of interaction to all those who registered for uh, the event. So with that, I'll pass it off to Marvin and Benji to say their goodbyes and thanks a lot to everybody. Thank you Marvin um, for sharing what you've done in the past five more so six and a half years yeah, yeah. here with us and it's been very very exciting to have you 
in the team and see how everything has uh, evolved. Thank you for having me and nice to meet you all and good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.